Welcome. Tonight, June 1st, 2021, is the 100 year anniversary of one of the worst episodes of racial domestic terrorism in our country's history, one that's been left out of the history books for most of the past century. In the past year, since the very public torture and murder of George Floyd, Americans are finally recognizing the history of violence against Black people and the national trauma caused by continual domestic terrorism against people of color. Some see this moment as the great reckoning where Americans are facing the atrocity of our history of slavery and ethnic cleansing. But as we speak, several states are actually trying to ban any discussion of slavery or racism in public schools, colleges, and universities, partly in response to the publication of the Pulitzer Prize winning 1619 Project. As of last week, 14 states have introduced some form of gag order legislation with respect to racial justice, critical race theory, and the teaching of racial injustice in American history. And I'm gonna name them. Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, Idaho, Iowa, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, New Hampshire, North Carolina, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, and Texas. Even the governor of Oklahoma, who sat until last week on the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commemoration Committee, voted for one of these bills, which are really no more than organized attacks on truth, history, and equity. Here at the Hammer Museum and at the UCLA Department of African American Studies, we know the truth. In 1921, a violent organized mob of virulently racist white people, envious and resentful of the successful middle and upper middle class African American residents of Tulsa's thriving Greenwood District, gathered in an organized planned attack with the aid of a local newspaper, the Ku Klux Klan, and even the National Guard to murder as many black residents as they could, steal all their material goods, and destroy anything they could not cart away by burning it down to the ground. As we've seen in so many ethnic cleansings around the globe, this was a case of neighbors attacking neighbors out of greed and tribalism, malice, and evil. To this day, no one knows how many people were actually murdered during the two-day rampage. Bodies were dumped into mass graves that have yet to be unearthed, but it was at minimum 200 people, probably much more, most shot down in the street or burned to death. Over 1,400 homes were destroyed, leaving eight to 10,000 people homeless. Amazingly, three survivors of the 1921 pogrom are still alive today and testified just last week before the US Congress in a panel to discuss how appropriate restitution, reparations, and healing could happen. But with a huge segment of white America actually trying to ban any discussion of racism in our public schools and institutions, it feels like we're a long way from justice for the victims of the Tulsa massacre. My wonderful colleague, Dr. Brenda Stevenson, and I have planned a series of discussions this week and next as the nation observes the 100th anniversary of the massacre with our attempt to unpack the history and legacy of this underexamined chapter of racial violence in the United States. These panels will discuss the history of the massacre and its on-screen representations, as well as other instances of domestic terrorism against communities of color in the US, the viability of reparations and the economic empowerment of black Americans. For tonight's program, we have two leading authors and experts on the 1921 massacre to discuss the history of black migration to Oklahoma, the Jim Crow realities of the early 20th century, the facts surrounding the Tulsa massacre and the immediate aftermath in which thousands of survivors were held in internment camps or prison, their families and financial lives devastated. Professor Carlos Hill is a board member for the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission, and he serves on the Board of Scholars for the Facing History and Ourselves Project which helps teachers address racism, anti-Semitism, and prejudice at pivotal moments in history. He's a history professor and chair of the Department of African and African American Studies at the University of Oklahoma, where he studies the history of lynching, racial violence, and their legacies on the Black experience. Hill is the author of three books, Beyond the Rope, The Impact of Lynching on Black Culture and Memory, and The Murder of Emmett Till, A Graphic History, and most recently, his new book came out, The 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, A Photographic History, in which he seeks to make a visually compelling case for why it's so important for the events of that day to be talked about and framed as a massacre. Hannibal B. Johnson is also a board member for the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Comm Commission, and he serves on the Federal Commission studying 400 years of African American history. He's a noted and widely published public historian and one of the leading scholars of the Tulsa Massacre. His groundbreaking 1998 book, Black Wall Street from Riot to Renaissance in Tulsa's historic Greenwood District, is a thorough account not only of the Tulsa race massacre itself, but of the history of black economic development in Oklahoma, beginning with the first wave of African American settlers to Oklahoma in the 1830s and 40s, and a huge influx in the late 1800s, when Oklahoma had 28 all black towns where African Americans could live with self-determination. <laughs> 
He's an attorney and consultant in Tulsa and has published many other books on Oklahoma history. And you can read his op-ed on the Tulsa massacre in yesterday's New York Times. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Brenda Stevenson, who, as I mentioned, has been my collaborator in putting together this series of programs. Dr. Stevenson is an internationally recognized scholar of race, slavery, gender, family, and racial conflict. She's a professor of history and African-American studies at UCLA, where she's the Nickel Family Endowed Chair. And she's on her way to England, where she will be the inaugural Hillary Rodham Clinton Chair in Women's History at Oxford University. Her most significant books include Life in Black and White, Family and Community in the Slave South, The Contested Murder of Latasha Harlins, Justice, Gender, and the Origins of the LA Riots, and What is Slavery? She was also the senior editor of the Encyclopedia of Black Women's History, and she's just now completing a book on the Black enslaved family. So now without further ado, please join me in welcoming Carlos Hill, Hannibal Johnson, and Brenda Stevenson. Hello, nice to see you gentlemen today. And we have a really important topic to discuss. So I won't wait, I'll just dig right into it. And I'm going to ask Hannibal, um, who has a magnificent storage of knowledge and has written a wonderful book on Black Wall Street uh, about Tulsa, Oklahoma, to tell us a little bit of the history of Tulsa, uh, particularly at the beginning of the 20th century when Oklahoma is beginning to, uh, well, becomes a state um, of the United States. And you have a fairly substantial um, population of Black people, about 10%. Um, tell us a little bit about Tulsa. What is Tulsa like in the beginning of the 20th century? At the beginning of the 20th century, Tulsa is really on its way to becoming the self-described oil capital of the world. That's what the boosters wanted Tulsa to be, this cosmopolitan city, which was the center of the universe in terms of oil production and the oil business, the fossil fuel business. So people were looking to Tulsa, migrating to Tulsa, black, white, and otherwise. A uh, number of African-Americans, some of them wealthy, including O.W. Gurley, who's credited with founding the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Black Wall Street, comes to Tulsa actually by way of a couple of, you know, a couple of years earlier, the, the land runs in 1889. That's how he gets to Oklahoma originally, but he comes to Tulsa in about 1906, buys some land, keeps some parcels for himself, establishes a number of businesses, and sells other parcels to other African Americans, including people like J.B. Stratford, prominent black lawyer, who's also the owner and operator of the Stratford Hotel, an elegant boutique hotel in the Greenwood District. So while Tulsa is on this upward trajectory, becoming this cosmopolitan, oil-rich city, there's simultaneously a Black business community born of the necessity of segregation, which builds in the Greenwood District, roughly a 35 square block area adjacent to downtown, separated quite literally by the Frisco Railroad tracks. This community becomes kind of a mecca for black businesses, mostly mom and pop type operations, small businesses and service providers. Now the community was dubbed Black Wall Street, but Black Wall Street in my mind is a misnomer. Black Main Street would be a better moniker. Because again, these were small businesses, mom and pop type operations, dance halls, pool halls, movie theaters, haberdasheries, restaurants, grocery stores, barber shops, beauty salons, shoe shine shops, small enterprises, plus black professionals, doctors, lawyers, dentists, accountants. This again was a community of necessity where black people founded kind of an insular black oasis when they were denied entry into the gates of the broader economy in downtown Tulsa. Dollars then circulated and recirculated within the confines of this constricted community, which in many ways benefited the community, economically, psychologically, and otherwise. And Tulsa was part of this tradition of, of Black people moving from the deep 
um, Southwest and establishing all black towns. And so Greenwood is, is, is not just a part of a segregated Tulsa, but it's also part of this movement, I believe of black people to the West and establishing their own municipalities, establishing their own business districts. Um, and they are coming from a place of course, that is deeply segregated, but segregated meaning violent, violence to white on black violence and uh, discrimination as well as losing the right to vote, um, et cetera. So are many of the people who are moving to Tulsa at the beginning of the 19th, uh, the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, are they coming from the deep South there or are they coming from other parts of the Midwest and the West? Many of them are coming in fact from the deep South. I wanna take a couple of steps back though. In terms of the Western migration of black folks, we can't forget that there were black members of the so-called five civilized tribes, the Cherokees, the Muscogee Creek, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Seminole. Mm -hmm. So the forced migration of the five civilized tribes out of the Southeastern United States in 1830s, 1840s included black folks. Right. Because all those tribes engaged in the practice of chattel slavery and all those tribes incorporated free black citizens as members of those tribes as well. So that's that's a great migration of black folks from the deep south into what was then Indian ter territory, what is now Oklahoma. In addition, in the late 1800s, there was really an official movement, a black boosterism movement led by people like E.P. McCabe, who had come to Oklahoma in the land run of 1889. McCabe actually set up a business. He sent written materials and he hired, literally hired people to go down south and recruit black folks to come to Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. He touted Oklahoma as kind of a Beulah land or promised land. It was a land of opportunity economically. Mm -hmm. And then also socially and politically, it was an escape from the deep oppression that people faced in Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia, or so he sold it that way. Mm -hmm. It didn't pan out that way. Oklahoma becomes the state in 1907 Indian Territory and Oklahoma Territory are united. And what's the first act passed by the legislature? A Jim Crow Act that segregates railroad facilities. Mm -hmm. Oklahoma ultimately would mirror or mimic the Deep South states from which people thought they were escaping. In fact, between statehood in 1907 and 1920, the year just before the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, there were 33 lynchings in Oklahoma. 27 of the victims were black. So it's out of the frying pan and into the fire, really, for a number of Black folks. Well, that's really important because not only the legacy of being attached to or um, involved in um, Indigenous life and culture and society, first as um, many of the people were, as you said, enslaved, but then later on as landholders and part of those, um, those nations. But it's also important to understand that what happens in 1921 is not something that the scale of it is, you know, great and grand and grotesque, but it's something that people have witnessed happening other places and happening certainly in the societies of the deep south um, from which they um, from which they arrived, and because. Indeed, not only black people are moving from the deep south to Oklahoma, but white people and white supremacy, the notions of white supremacy are moving uh, along with them. All right. Well, thank you very much for telling us how we get to 1921 and what we see in the black community during that time period. I'm now going to turn to Carlos. Carlos was written again, a magnificent book on um, the photography um, from this massacre, but also um, has been invested very much along with you, Hannibal, um, in letting the nation, letting the world, letting the community know about what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma um, in 1921. So Carlos, um, can you take us to the end of May in 1921 um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Tell us what happens. Well, I certainly can. And I just want to thank you, uh, Brenda, as well as the Hammer Museum for, for having me here. And thank you, Hannibal, for really setting up um, a really great conversation about um, the race massacre. And so I just want to reinforce what Hannibal said, um, you know, and I want to 
just make it really, really clear that um, prior to the race massacre and certainly circa 19, May 31st, 1921, um, you know, Greenwood um, was one of the most affluent black communities uh, in the country. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about it as one of the wealthiest, but it was also one of the most educated. Um, it was also, we could say, one of the most peaceful, we could even say most God-fearing Black communities in America. Um, you know, Greenwood uh, was truly, and, and I think still remains, a symbol of Black excellence. Mm. And we just, we just have to, to underscore um, that, that point, because when you understand that, the horror of what occurred um, becomes a little bit more clear. And so <clears throat> when we think about the race massacre, we have to be careful not to make it an exceptional event. Um, the race massacre was not exceptional, right? Uh, white mobs had attacked black communities for decades, right? Beginning in the mid 19th century. Even two years before the race massacre, white mobs had attacked black communities in over 24 cities uh, in America in the summer, in the red summer of 1919. Mm -hmm. And so attacking black communities is not exceptional. Even burning down black communities is not exceptional. Mm -hmm. What is exceptional, um, or excuse me, unprecedented about the race massacre is the scale of it. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to try to imagine is a 35 block area that is vibrant, that is lively in all the ways that Hannibal suggested. In 24 hours, in less than 24 hours, that 35 block area, 11,000 black residents, nearly 200 businesses in 1921, in less than 24 hours, that community is destroyed. And when I say destroyed, I mean every significant building, home, business, school, hospital, destroyed mm -hmm. or severely damaged. Mm -hmm. And so what was destroyed was not just buildings, right? It wasn't just homes, right? The goal was to destroy an idea, right? Of Greenwood as a Black Wall Street mm -hmm. of America, as a symbol for what was possible entrepreneurially for Black people. That idea was what the target of the attack was ultimately. And so when we, when we think about the race massacre, it wasn't just, you know, buildings destroyed. It wasn't just um, homes destroyed. Every person in Greenwood was impacted, right? Every person was impacted. Because, because every building or structure was destroyed, that meant nearly 11,000 black residents were rendered homeless, right? And so this was a huge humanitarian crisis post massacre. But my point is that everyone in this community was impacted by what occurred. And we believe that at least, and when I say we, I believe, I say historians uh, who have carefully studied this, that as many, and some would say um, many more, but 300, at least 300 black lives were lost because of the violence. And so this history um, is not exceptional, but it's, it's, it's unprecedented for a community the size of Greenwood to be destroyed in the way that it was as quickly as it was and there be, you know, a hundred years later, no reparations, right, for what occurred, no justice, no accountability 
for the individuals um, who perpetuated it and the institutions that were responsible or unresponsive uh, mm -hmm. to the needs of the community before, during, and after the massacre. And so I wanted to set that up so that I can then just briefly touch upon the three moments that precipitated the, mo the deadliest outbreak of anti-Black violence in American history. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, I would say the three or four key moments um, is one, in, on, on May 30th, uh, a young Black man by the name of Dick Rowland um, entered a elevator in the Drexel building in downtown Tulsa. And we know that Dick Rowland was a, a shoeshine uh, who worked nearby to the Drexel building, but he used the Drexel building um, and the facilities in the Drexel building um, because his boss was able to get access to, to those facilities for, for his workers. We know that Sarah Page was an elevator operator uh, who worked in the Drexel building. So we, sur we surmise that uh, Dick Rowland and Sarah Page likely had a relationship or at minimum knew each other because um, Dick Rowland would have frequented the building a lot and she was an elevator operator in the building. So they would have perhaps uh, run into each other multiple times. Um, needless to say, um, what actually sort of propels uh, Sarah Page and Dick Rowland into history is there is an incident um, in the elevator on the morning of the 30th. And we don't know quite what happens. We don't know if Dick Rowland, as he's about to enter the elevator, trips and bumps into Sarah Page, or if, you know, by the sight of Dick Rowland, perhaps she was startled, she screams, she runs away. We don't know quite what happened uh, that precipitated Sarah Page fleeing the elevator, Dick Rowland fleeing the elevator in the other direction. Uh, we don't know what happened because the police who actually came to the to to um, to to the scene, who were called to the scene, did not keep a record of the conversation that they had with the shop owner, or uh, that that Sarah Page fled to, or we don't have um, you know any record of what um, you know she told them, and so that part of this is truly lost um, to history. Some would even suggest that there was a relationship between Dick Rowland and Sarah Page. Um, and somehow they got into an argument, they were overheard, they feared that they were, had been overheard. And the story that she ends up telling of being assaulted was a way to cover up this consensual relationship with, with Dick Rowland because they thought someone heard them arguing and that would have um, implicated them as having some, uh, an untoward relationship, um, you know, certainly at the time between a black man and a white woman, a young white woman would have been uh, sensational. Uh, and so that's a theory. Um, whatever happened, this, uh, this incident sets in motion um, speculation that a black man, Dick Rowland has, has assaulted a white woman, and as the rumors spread, and as the Tulsa Tribune begins to report, um, you know about it, insinuating that Dick Rowland has and did, in fact, assault Sarah Page. As this, as this news, as this, as these rumors are spreading, whites are beginning to come downtown um, to 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 find out what happened and express their outrage about what happened. And so if we fast forward to the 31st of, of, of May, Dick Rowland um, has been arrested on suspicion of assaulting Sarah Page. Uh, he's being held at the county courthouse. And uh, you know by 3 p.m. on the 31st, um, there is a Tulsa Tribune article um, that again insinuates that Dick Rowland has, um, you know, did in fact assault Sarah Page. And this only leads to, you know, confirming the kind of rumors that have been swirling already. And then we know that that evening, um, there was an, 
editorial uh, that was published by the Tulsa Tribune that all but called for Dick, for Weiss to come downtown to Tulsa and take part in the lynching of uh, anticipated lynching of Dick Rowland. There was a editorial that has been lost to history. Um, you know, that uh, the title of that editorial was entitled To Lynch a Negro Tonight. And so the Tulsa Tribune essentially added flame, uh, you know, at gasoline to this already combustible situation. And by 9, 930 that evening, hundreds of whites have come downtown to, you know, take part in what they believe will be uh, a lynching of Dick Rowling. Carlos. And Yes. I just want to. I just want to stop for a moment and have Hannibal come in and tell us a little bit about um, the men who are in the black community. I understand that a number of them um, were uh, returning soldiers, had been in the military, um, and had taken up the defense of the community, um, and were well armed to do so. Given that there was, as Carlos indicated, and you indicated too, this history, uh, this long history of attacking black communities and attacking um, black business areas in particular, under the guise of, you know, um, someone black has done something unto wars, particularly towards a white woman or towards white property, et cetera. Can you um, add a little bit with regard to um, the black men who participate in the defense of the community and of, uh, of Mr. Rowland? Right, great point to bring up. Um, people hear about the massacre and they often don't understand that there was active resistance in the black community. There were a number of World War I veterans who were trained and knew, knew how to use weapons and possessed weapons. Uh, one of the things that happened after World War I was that black men, not just in Tulsa, but, but, but everywhere were emboldened because they had sacrificed or potentially sacrificed their lives, put their lives on the line for the country in foreign service. Yet they come back to the country which is ostensibly home, and they are they are rejected. In fact, some black men are lynched in their military uniforms after World War I and after World War II. So black men come back to Tulsa after having served in World War I, and they are much more likely to um, stand up for their civil rights and for their human rights. So that is no less the case in the context of, of, of the massacre. The additional thing that happens in Tulsa is there's a presence of a, uh, a black self-defense group called the African Blood Brotherhood. It's kind of a short-lived group based, I believe, in New York, but they had a, actually had a presence here in Tulsa during the massacre, and they were sort of the Black Panthers of the day. I mean, they, they were not designed or intended to go on the offensive, but rather to defend the community against what were pretty routine, random attacks on black communities all over the nation. And I think Carlos is absolutely right when he says that, and, and what you've said earlier, what happened in Tulsa in 1921 was not unique. I use the word emblematic. It was emblematic of the racial violence and racial trauma perpetrated by whites on black communities all throughout the nation. And in Tulsa, again, there were a number of black men who said, this is not going to happen on our watch. We're not gonna stand idly by and let our community be overtaken. Of course, they were outnumbered and outgunned, um, but they put up a vigorous, robust, but short-lived defense of the community. Uh, and isn't it true that there had been a lynching of a black man previously um, in Oklahoma? Uh, I know that there were many lynchings, but recent, right before this happens, um, the fear for Dick Rowland was that there was another young black man who had been lynched, had been tied well, up and shot to death or something for supposedly being well, um, in a relationship with a, a white woman. Well, actually, the, the, I think the, the, the lynching that's more important in the context of Tulsa is the lynching of a teenage white boy mm. uh, just nine months earlier. Mm -hmm. so, so 
black men that's in the community felt if they're going to lynch a teenage white boy for a crime that he has not been, he may have actually committed the crime, but he hadn't been convicted. If they're going to be vigilantes with respect to this teenage white boy, then what is the hope for a teenage black boy? So the fear is not just for, you know, um, uh, being a black victim of white violence, but of the vigilantism too that kind of took over um, in the place of um, the police systems that were there. Um, and oftentimes we see police systems include people who are involved in the vigilantism. And I do believe that there was a black that Tulsa had an integrated police force, integrated police force at the time. So I'm going to switch back over now to Carlos. If you would talk to us a little bit about when this, you know, the, we have the spark, we have the forces coming together. What happens when they actually meet? Yes. So I'm so glad that Hannibal really uh, seized upon the active resistance of Greenwood residents because. Um, not only was there deep concern for Dick Rowland and his safety, trying to prevent you know, him from being lynched, but black men coming downtown, two groups of black men coming downtown, the first smaller, the second one larger, were coming downtown to protect Dick Rowland, but also what brought them there was this long established tradition of collective self, excuse me, collective armed self-defense. Uh, to racial violence. And so this tradition uh, begins um, in, you know, in the aftermath of slavery, um, but really comes to life in the 1890s in the early 20th century through the work and through witness of Ida B. Wells who counseled black people, but especially black men that the best way to stop a lynching was to stop a lynching. <laughs> and to stop a lynching meant literally putting your body on the line, um, putting your body between the jail um, and the mob um, and doing that um, with pride, doing that with dignity. And so having arms was really, really important. And so that tradition is what brought black men to downtown and that completely electrified the situation uh, because what whites saw uh, we're proud black men, some in their military uniforms coming down trial, trying to tell them what to do, trying to take, trying to take power over the situation, right? And so this infuriated the mob and led to one member of that mob to try to disarm one of the black men who had come downtown to protect Dick Rowland. And so in the tussle over that weapon, from this proud black veteran and this white so white participant in this, this growing mob, this lynching in the making, between and within that tussle over that weapon, a shot is fired, hits a white bystander, and literally all hell breaks loose. And white, white men who had come downtown to lynch Dick Rowland. Um, turn all of their attention on those black men who had come downtown to his defense. And ultimately, uh, because of the ways in which the Tulsa police escalate um, this initial uh, uh, sort of outbreak of violence, the ways in which they escalate it leads to, I believe, the deadliest attack on a black community in American history. And so um, I just wanted to make sure we understand that it wasn't just out of self-concern that brought black people to downtown. There was this larger tradition of collective armed self-defense. Um, and that is what, you know, that's, that helps explain why there was a African blood brotherhood in Tulsa. Um, it was in many ways emblematic of sort of black politics at the time. Yes, and we're talking about a period that it's, you know, it's, it hasn't been long since slavery has ended. I mean, we're talking about five decades or six decades since slavery has ended. And a part of, you know, defining oneself as being a free person, as being a, a free man um, to take on, you know, what is, a, what is manhood in the Black community is defense. 
of children, defense of women, a defense of property, defense of life. And so this tradition, which, you know, it's, it really comes to life, of course, after, during and after the Civil War, but we see it in slave revolts and maroon societies, et cetera, prior to Civil War. But this notion of Black manhood uh, lives very largely um, and resolutely um, in African-American males and women who want to be protected, um, who need to be protected um, by armed men um, at the time. So we've got white manhood for in terms of what defines a white man is having superiority over um, a black man and being able to protect their women from black men. That's a big part of how, and of course, also having great, having wealth and, you know, all that control of the government. And then you've got black men um, who are determined also to protect their community, to protect their wealth status, their property, the dependents, their wives and children within the community. Um, and we've got a police force that um, is not effective to, to, you know, if I could just use, they're ineffective, they're much more complicit than that, but they are ineffective in, um, in, in keeping this from happening. So once this, all hell breaks loose, breaks loose, what happens then? Tell us about some of the details yeah. uh, of this tragic and violent um, and purposefully violent event. And I'll set this up because I know Hannibal can definitely uh, share a lot here, but I would say there are two critical um, things that occurred shortly after the exchange of gunfire between black men and white men uh, downtown. Um, uh, the first is, as I, what I alluded to earlier, immediately after shots are fired, almost immediately after shots are fired, Tulsa authorities began to systematically deputize whites who had just come downtown white men and white boys who had just come downtown to see a lynching or participate in the lynching of Dick Rowland, they take this angry mob and begin to deputize them one by one. We think as many as 500 whites, they probably were more, uh, were deputized by Tulsa authorities um, following that, that initial outbreak of violence. Had the Tulsa police, instead of escalate the situation, actually try to disarm everyone who has a weapon downtown or at least everyone who was shooting um, to disarm them, detain or arrest them. I think we could safely call what occurred a massacre or excuse me, a riot. But because the Tulsa authorities, Sheriff Department, Police Department, deputized the mob, weaponized the mob, that had come, just come downtown to Lynch Dick Rowland. This, now this, 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 this mob and growing mob has been deputized. They've been given sanction, right? To arrest, detain, and even kill black men who they now believe um, are an open rebellion against Tulsans, um, white Tulsa specifically. And so had the police acted differently we might be talking about a race riot, but because they did not, you know, de-escalate, mm -hmm. they in fact escalated by weaponizing and deputizing the mob, this set the scene for the deadliest attack on the black, on a black community in American history. And just the second point that I would make, and then I want to hand it over to Hannibal because I know he can really get into the, the details of what occurred to black people um, during the violence. But I would say one of the reasons why I really emphasize that this was a massacre versus a race riot, riot versus a pogrom versus a disaster is, you know, at 5 a.m. after the entire evening and the early morning hours being an exchange of, of gunfire between black men and white men, um, on the on the border of the of the Greenwood District, um, 
at 5 a.m., whites launch an attack on the community. And when I say an attack, I mean, imagine at 5 a.m., a whistle, a whistle or a siren um, uh, signaling to whites who have, who have you know, placed themselves on, those, uh, on the border of the Greenwood District, particularly on the south border, and I believe on the western border of the district. And at 5 a.m., when, when the siren is sounded, those whites invade um, Greenwood. Um, we think thousands, ultimately, of whites invaded Greenwood and began to loot, burn, kill Black people who were trying to defend their homes, trying to defend their businesses, some trying to flee, um, others just trying to survive um, this, this assault. And so I'm emphasizing the 5 a.m. because I wanted people to understand that this was a coordinated attack. This was, in fact, a military styled assault, uh, because we know from survivor accounts that machine guns were used to bombard uh, the community. Um, we know that airplanes were used, uh, or at least uh, survivors have talked about, have remembered airplanes flying above and projectiles, right? Rudimer rudimer rudimentary um, explosives were dropped on, on Greenwood, making it the only community um, that was bombed from the air in the continental United States uh, in American history. And so this is an ugly history, but it's not a race riot. I would argue that it's a massacre because it was a, it was a deliberate systematic assault on a community with the support um, and with the sanction of local authorities. And so this is a much more horrific story. And I know Hannibal can, can, can add more depth to, to what I've just said. Yeah, I want, thank you very much. I want to turn over to Hannibal for a moment, um, more than a moment, and talk a little bit about the genocidal aspects uh, of this event. Because, you know, we go from looking at a race riot to a massacre. But when you talk about, you know, the systematic determination to destroy a community and everyone and everything in the community, it does speak to the term genocide. Um, and it does, you know, and when we talk about genocide, again, we have to wrap back around, of course, and talk about reparations as well. So I, I'd like Hannibal, if you will, to talk a little bit about whether or not um, you would categorize this as a genocidal moment, as we've seen, you know, in Rosewood, as we saw in Memphis, as we saw in Wilmington, as we saw in Detroit, Chicago, so many other places in which there is there are coordinated efforts to kill each and every Black person, to destroy all of their property or to acquire that property first for yourselves and destroy whatever um, is left over. So can you talk a little bit about the genocidal aspects of it too? And I want both of you all to speak a little bit to the gendered aspects of it. What was going on with the women? I've seen some of your photographs, Carlos, in which women are marching alongside um, these white men um, to, um, to attack. And I know in East St. Louis, for example, women were, uh, white women were attacking black women and black children. I'd like to find out if some of that was happening also in Tulsa. So let me just start with the, the broader concept of, of nomenclature, which is, which is something I deal with quite a bit. Um, for, for me, what, what's most important here is critical thinking and critical analysis. So when we look at, at, the, at the terminology, when we look at nomenclature, when we look at riot or massacre or these other terms, there are essentially five questions that I think we should ask ourselves. One is who named this event? Two is who was absent from the table and thus not participating when the event was named? Three is what is the substantive purpose or, or, or function served by the name? So we know that this event historically is known as the 1921 Tulsa race riot. 
So riot has particular significance in the insurance industry because most insurance, many insurance policies certainly then had what's called force majeure clauses, clauses that have exclusions. And one of the exclusions was for damage occasioned by riot or civil unrest. So insurance co companies really got off scot-free if this was categorized as a riot. So that, that's significant. Next is once we know the facts as they occurred, what alternatives are there in terms of naming? So with respect to this event, some terms that we might consider are riot, white riot, assault, pogrom, holocaust, massacre, genocide, ethnic cleansing. That's just eight, that's the eight terms that I come up with right now. There, there are more terms that we could consider. So knowing the facts on the ground and marshalling the evidence that is to be marshaled, what will we call it? And then the final question simply is, given the foregoing four questions and your responses to those, if this happened today, what would you call it? So I think there's, there's certainly room for discussion and debate in terms of, of nomenclature. I think there is no perfect term. The term that is in vogue right now is massacre. I use the term massacre because we have to have a common language and I, I can't go into a 15 minute discussion about this every time I mention it. So I use the term massacre, but I thought, and people have, have actually come up to me and said, you know, I'm not comfortable with the term massacre either because massacre marginalizes and diminishes the resistance effort on the part of black men who defended the community. Because massacre, and these people were saying to me, massacre to, to them connotes slaughter, which is an onslaught on helpless, defenseless victims. And they want to elevate the notion that no, people in the Greenwood community were not, not, certainly not all helpless and defenseless. They put up a robust resistance. So the most important thing for me is that we go through the process of critical thinking and analysis and before reaching some conclusion and that we not be dismissive of people who don't share our particular landing on this point. That there, there, are, there are possibilities that all are rational um, and we can discuss and debate those and we ought to. All right, so thank you very much. That's absolutely correct. And it, it, it provides a broader and a deeper, uh, more layered um, context for us to think about this as we move forward. Can I get back though to the issue of the women? What were the women doing? You know, I've seen some of the testimony of people who were still alive um, when they were asked about it. So I've seen some of the oral histories and some of the women and they were little girls or, or they were young, very, very young. Um, do you have, Carlos, did, were you able to, or Hannibal, when you were looking through um, and the testimony and things that come out at the end, I know that there's some testimony, particularly after people were arrested, that some of the employers went in, the female employers went in and tried to, you know, get the people out of, uh, of being incarcerated. Um, and so could you talk a little bit about um, first of all, just give us a rundown of what was destroyed. I mean, in terms of the numbers, the amounts of money and that kind of thing. And, um, and then who was held accountable for it? Um, who was, because, you know, you know, the black men are, are, are disarmed or unarmed and, you know, and held and, and all of that's happening. So tell us a little bit about that. And then also get back to please my question on, on women. Yes. Okay. I, I'm going to try to, were you going to say something ahead of all? <laughs> uh, which part do you want me to, uh, go, ahead. go ahead. Okay. No, no, I, I just, I'm just going to say something. I'll, I'll be very quick here. Um, and I'll, I'll try to address both questions. Um, so when I say that every, you know, building, every structure, uh, in this community destroy it, what I'm talking about is, you know, over 1200 homes, I'm talking about two, nearly 200 businesses destroyed. Um, 
between, you know, there were about 1.8 to $2.5 million in claims that, that black survivors uh, sought to get restitution for, but of course they did not. And so the, the, the destruction was cataclysmic. I mean, a community that was 35 blocks is destroyed, is no longer. Um, and what is so powerful about the story of the race massacre is not what happened to the community, but what they did in response to what happened to them right. and how the community rebuilt. And I know we're gonna get a chance to talk about that, but I just wanted to, to just shine some light on that. And so the, 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 the violence was cataclysmic. And so part of the reason why we know the history of the race massacre is because of a black woman. Uh, I'll say the part of the reason why we know it the way we know it um, through survivor testimony is because of Mary Parrish, a black woman, Greenwood resident, a school teacher um, in the community. Um, she writes the first, I would argue, the first history, real history of the race massacre. And in that book, uh, which is entitled Events of the Tulsa Disaster, published in 1922, 1923, um, she tells us from the, from the voices right, of survivors, what happened to them, right? She tells, them, tells us about um, the, the, the violence that occurred to them, the businesses and homes lost. She, she, she serves it up to us in ways that, that humanize the victims and at the same time powerfully conveys the scope of the destruction, the scale of the horror. And so without her courage to write a book right, and, and publish that book and a community in which it just, this violence just occurred, took a level of brave, bravery. Um, and so she is a part of that resistance or a continuance of that resistance that began downtown um, with black men trying to defend, defend Dick Rowland. She does that in the aftermath, but also during the event, in, in events of the Tulsa disaster, she tells us, uh, Mary Paris tells us how she fled Greenwood with her child, uh, ducking and dodging <laughs> behind buildings um, in chicken coops um, to get out of Greenwood where the violence was unfolding. And so we learn the kinds of uh, things that Black women had to do to protect themselves, to protect their families um, during the massacre. And we know that because of Mary Paris. So black women have been essential to the telling of an authentic history of the race massacre. Um, and they were certainly part of the resistance uh, to it as it was unfolding. In terms of white women, um, I think um, what, we what we know from the photographic record is that many white women came to Greenwood, um, if not before, but after the massacre had, had sort of come to an end um, I have several, I show several pictures of white women sort of, sort of posing in front of ruined buildings in the Greenwood district. Um, you know, certainly um, I think there were white women who were part of the, 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 the mob that is downtown, um, you know, that is, that is desiring to, to lynch Dick Rowland. I think ultimately, um, you know, we don't know enough about, uh, you know, uh, white women role or, or others role in the massacre. And that's why an invest the investigation or a true investigation of what occurred could have revealed these things. But the only the true uh, investigation into what occurred occurred 80 years after the fact um, in, in between 1997 and 2001. And so in that time, in that, in that span of time, so much evidence, uh, so much history was either lost or purposefully destroyed. Um, and so there are many things about who was involved that we don't know because it was, the race massacre was never properly uh, investigated at the time. Can we take a break right now and look at some of your images, your just mind-blowing images. Um, they're very difficult to, to see, but as a way of memorializing, remembering, and deeply understanding 
what was lost um, or what was threatened um, on that day. Can we take a break now and um, let me allow you to please introduce the material we're about to see. Um, I think we would all benefit now from seeing exactly what we've been talking about. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I discovered in digging into the photographic legacy of the massacre is how many photographs uh, were taken of the, not only the violence, um, but also the rebuilding of the community. And so in my sort of research or initial research on the race massacre, once I arrived to Oklahoma in 2016, um, I was just blown away by the number of photographs that told this story. Um, and I just wanted to look at them more and more and more. And so I began to, as I began to understand how many photographs there were and how diverse they were, I could, you know, you, it's possible to try to tell the story of what occurred through the imagery. And so I say all that to say that um, I would argue that not only is the race massacre, the deadliest attack on a black community in American history, it's also likely the most photographed instance of anti-black violence or, or, or an attack on a, a black community in American history. Um, in the course of my research, um, at least 500 images um, I could have utilized to try to tell that story. I ended up um, putting in the book about 140 images of the violence and then another 40 of survivors to make sure that we were grounding this history uh, and the history and the memory of survivors. And so the images that I'm going to share with you um, are all, were all taken from library collections in, in Oklahoma and across the country. Um, and what I, what I always say about these images is that while they do tell us, help us to understand the destruction to the community, the loss of life um, uh, during, this, during this massacre, these photographs do not tell us the history from the vantage point of, 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 of victim survivors and their descendants. Most of these photographs, particularly the photographs in my book, were taken by whites. And they were taken as a way to document um, the suppression of a Negro rebellion. And so there's nothing redemptive about these photographs. These photographs are hard to look at. But my challenge in writing this book was to try to disrupt that white supremacist glare and narrative that gave rise to these images, uh, the lynching culture uh, that was pervasive in America that gave rise to whites in the first place coming downtown to Tulsa, downtown Tulsa to lynch Dick Rowland. And so part of my goal in sharing these images taken mostly by whites for the purposes of, of, of sort of celebrating this suppression of this quote unquote Negro rebellion, my goal was to try to use survivor accounts and voices to disrupt that narrative, if, if only temporarily, so that um, you could, so that the readers could understand and absorb perhaps better the stories that survivors were telling in those accounts. And so the, the, the goal of the book is really transgressive, right, to really disrupt um, the white supremacist gaze and the white supremacist narrative um, of suppression of a Negro rebellion. And so to that extent that I do that in the book, the book is a success, but at minimum, what I wanted to do is to tell the story from the vantage point of victim survivors and their descendants. And I think those images uh, paired with those, that testimony lends itself to it. And so I'm gonna share about, um, 40 images of the massacre that try to tell the story from the beginning uh, of the outbreak of violence all the way through to when the community is destroyed. And so I'm going to, I'm not going to um, provide commentary over the images. I want to create a space, a solemn space for you to, to view the images, absorb the images on the back end of the, uh, on the, on the back side of it all, 
we can have a conversation about some of the, the things and the images. And so with that, I will share my screen.
Well, that certainly is sobering and it certainly is devastating. Um, even if it's not taken from the perspective of the victims, we can all see the kind of, I mean, it looks like a war zone. It looks like a very bad war zone, um, as a matter of fact. Um, tell me, um, both of you all, tell me a little bit about the aftermath. I mean, um, the incarceration of Black people, the kinds of suspension of what seems like all civil rights for Black people um, at this time period, having to go back to the time where you have to have identity, uh, identifying cards with you and a particular kind of identifying cards um, where, you know, people are houseless, homeless, um, have, don't have food to eat, don't have anywhere to sleep. Um, there are no schools for children to go to, no churches for people to worship in. Um, and at the end of that, there's a, a magnificent story of rebirth, of regrowth, of redevelopment. Um, so can you all just talk a little bit about, first of all, um, the incarceration of Black people and the struggle to regain one's lives um, and then there's then the act of rebuilding, um, reconnecting with the black dream um, that is Tulsa, Oklahoma. So one of the interesting things that happened during the massacre was that uh, the, the violence lasted roughly 16 hours. It was quelled by a unit of the National Guard, which was sent in from Oklahoma City. Uh, martial law was declared in Tulsa and the National Guard actually set up this internment process, very much like people of Japanese ancestry were interned in World War II. So black people were, were essentially rounded up and taken to uh, several internment centers throughout the city. And generally one had to have a green card, kind of an identification card, countersigned by a white person to get out of these internment centers. You mentioned the women, what about women? Well, a number of the women survivors talked about the internment process which affected mostly male people. Uh, but it, what, what it did effectively was to leave the Greenwood community defenseless so that the people who were coming in were able to burn and loot, pillage, et cetera, and really ransack the community while many of the men were away, locked up in these internment centers, which is a very interesting proposition. The, the ultimate story here is about the indomitable human spirit, really. So. It, you know, the, the massacre happened, but the massacre is, is as a chapter in a much larger narrative. It is, it is one thing, but, but the ultimate thing is the people and the community. So the people and the community began the rebuilding really as the embers still smoldered from the massacre. By 1925, the National Negro Business League, the Black Chamber of Commerce set up by Booker T. Washington, hosted its national conference here in Tulsa. And that is both a testament to the people of the Greenwood community and a testament to the Black community writ large throughout the nation who contributed to the rebuilding because they saw it as symbolic of this sort of philosophy that we bend but we don't break. We shall not be moved, right? So that, that was really important. The other thing that's important is the obstacles in, in the pathway of the black community as it sought to rebuild. The city of Tulsa sought to extend the fire code and make it more difficult to rebuild. It was cost prohibitive for many people to rebuild. And B.C. Franklin, the father of eminent historian, Dr. John Hope Franklin, challenged that in court. He was a prominent lawyer here in the community. The Tulsa Tribune, that daily afternoon newspaper that we've mentioned before, three days after the massacre, this is three days after the Greenwood District has been pretty much obliterated, wiped off the face of the map. The Tulsa Tribune ran an article, it was actually an editorial, entitled, It Must Not Be Again. Now, if, if you didn't know better, you'd think, it must not be again. That's that They're going to say, wow, this is horrible destruction. We can't let, ever let that happen in Tulsa again. That's not what it said. It must not be again. The editorial began this way. Such a district as the old nigger town must never be allowed in Tulsa again. It was a cesspool of iniquity and corruption. First two sentences of a much larger editorial. A grand jury was convened. The adjutant general who led the National Guard said that 
the event was caused by, and I quote, an impudent Negro, a hysterical girl, and a yellow journal. The Tulsa mayor, T.D. Evans, the Tulsa City Commission, and the Tulsa Chamber of Commerce referred to the event as a Negro uprising, a Negro uprising. So when we talk about causative factors with regard to the massacre, one of the things I mentioned is a psychological term, cognitive dissonance. The environment was suffused in white supremacy. And part of the psychology was these black folks, these uppity black folks across this track, I'm looking north to this community, they're living in homes that they own, they're driving cars, they're going to parties and, and they have their own businesses. I'm white, that's what I should be doing and I'm not doing that. So there's cognitive dissonance. And so how do you harmonize this disconnect? Well, violence is one way that you bring the black community down a peg. So that's one of the big causative factors. Carlos, can you add a little bit to that? Although that was brilliantly um, <laughs> announced for us. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Hannibal. No. no, Hannibal makes my job very easy on this panel. Um, I, I would just second what, what Hannibal uh, said and, and, and just maybe try to reinforce it a little bit. Um, I think the most important story um, is not what happened to the community, but how they res have responded to what happened to them. And so not only did the community rebuild, um, but 20 years, if you fast forward 20 years after the massacre, we can begin to think about Greenwood as experiencing a renaissance or a golden age period. And so we have to, again, just step back and think about this community that had by 1921 become, you know, the quote unquote Negro Wall Street of America or Black Wall Street of America, um, a symbol of Black excellence and a symbol of Black possibility is completely destroyed everything gone and 20 years after the fact it's bigger so there are more black people in greenwood than there had been in 1921 it is there are more businesses in you know 20 years later than there had been in 1921 and so in the span of less than a generation this community rebuilt and experienced the golden age and so when, when, when Hannibal says the indomitable human spirit, that's what he's talking about because you know, black survivors rebuild in a context in which not only the city was very hostile to them rebuilding and tried to block it, white Tulsans, right? Who helped to destroy it, did not want them to rebuild. Um, and you know, I know that was at least a sentiment of those who participated in the violence because of the postcards, the photographs that whites left. And one prominent photograph um, that was depicted in that slideshow, there's a postcard that says, running the Negro out of Tulsa, running the Negro out of Tulsa. And so, what whites really had in mind wasn't just a massacre, it was actually expelling black people from Tulsa, ridding itself of this symbol of black excellence. Uh, because for, white, for whites, Greenwood was a kind of nightmare. Um, they saw in Greenwood the future perhaps, one in which black people were as wealthy and most worriedly, Black people had social and political equality. And Greenwood was a symbol of that for them. And so white Tulsans wanted Greenwood gone as well. And so despite that hostility, this community found a way without any help from the city to rebuild. And not only rebuild, to experience a renaissance 20 years later, less than a generation. And so to me, this is the story. And so 
because like, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around who does that, right? Where does where do they do that at? Where you get your community is destroyed in less than 24 hours, and in 20 years, you know, their community is rebuilt and is bigger and better and wealthier than it had been. That's a true story of human resilience and grit. Um, and so I always wonder what Greenwood would have been had the city supported rebuilding and not put up impediments. What if more white businesses uh, or white individuals that actually aided the rebuilding, what would Greenwood have become? And so that's the question. Um, and I think, um, you know, Hannibal has definitely shared why, you know, in, particularly in talking about what was in Greenwood before, why it's so urgent for us to be thinking about questions of reparations. Well, thank you all so very much for this devastatingly important discussion about Tulsa, um, its commemoration. I wanna thank you all for the efforts that you have both brilliantly put forward so that we will know this story, so that everyone will know this story and will know the resilience, will know um, that we as, you know, that we still rise. So thank you all very, very much. Welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Hello, I'm Brenda Stevenson and welcome to The Hammer. Um, I'm introducing myself because you just saw me on it on, on screen, but that was pre-taped. And so I just wanna reintroduce myself and welcome all of you all and thank you for being here. Um, I have been asked to please alert you all to the other events that will be taking place with regard to the 100th um, year commemoration of the Tulsa Race Massacre. And so, first of all, I'd like to let you know that on Thursday, there will be a discussion about the Tulsa Massacre in the popular television show Watchmen with Damon Lindolf, who is a creator, and Court Jefferson, one of the writers. And um, also, there will be other programming that's taking place, at least two other programs. So please go to the website and sign up. Um, all of it, I think, is very interesting, as was the screening that you just saw, and it is very thought-provoking and, of course, quite informative. So I'm going to be answering the questions that come up in the chat. And um, so if you have any, and if I can answer them, I'm going to full disclosure tell you that while I am an expert in African-American history, um, I have not written specifically on the Tulsa race massacre. Um, and therefore I will be relying on accounts that I have read. And of course, all the wonderful programming um, that is taking place now. Okay, I have a plane flying over my home, so I'll take a brief break. I have a question from uh, Benoit, uh, and I and apologize if I have pronounced the name incorrectly. And the question is, I hear and read conflict, um, conflicting accounts as to who piloted the planes that dropped incendiary bombs on Greenwood. Some accounts blame private citizens, others point to the National Guard. Any insight? Well, thank you for your question. I have done some research um, on this particular matter, and it doesn't seem to be clear. You're absolutely right. There are There is conflicting information about it. Most of the information, if we talk about uh, firsthand accounts, for example, um, from the survivors who were there or people who have written about it, who, were, who had survived it um, previously, have said that they believe that it was private citizens. Now, why would there be um, confusion? There'd be confusion because, of course, the Oklahoma National Guard was there um, on site. They, they came in at about um, a few hours or, or several hours after the massacre began. Unfortunately, they are implicated in being complicit with those persons who attacked um, 
black businesses, um, as well as um, bombing, not bombing, but burning black homes and businesses, and also of arresting um, black persons and putting them into what we would think of as internment camps. So they have were complicit with the abuse of the African American citizens who were in Tulsa at the time, but we don't seem to have a lot of evidence with regard to them having piloted the planes that bombed the Greenwood district, right? So I hope that's helpful. And hopefully, um, as we continue to explore what happened in Greenwood, and there's a tremendous effort by numerous historians, um, both professional and those persons who live um, in Greenwood, collecting oral histories, of course, also um, with the archeological digs that are going on, trying to recover the, the sites of mass um, of mass burials, um, also trying to just put all the records back together again to see precisely what happened when on a minute by minute basis, we may be able to answer this question more clearly um, in the next few years, but right now we don't have a direct answer um, to it. So are there other questions that you all have this evening? If so, please do put them in the chat. Okay, thank you. I have a question from um, Ruth Strauss, which says, I noted that so many photographs were labeled quote unquote, Negro uprising. So those were guarded from white libraries or how do you think they were guarded? Uh, and thank you for the compliment on the excellent panel. Um, uh, it's a photograph is bragging about the destruction. The photographs are both bragging about the, uh, are bragging about the destruction. Um, and these are photographs that are mostly taken by um, white persons who were in Tulsa at the time. Um, and they were, some of them were taken also by African-Americans, particularly when you get to those that um, deal with the Red Cross and the, some of them were taken by the Red Cross as well. Um, they were called Negro uprising because race massacres often were blamed on the victims. Um, and so they did not want to say that they had instigated the massacre. Um, they wanted to blame um, the people who actually were killed and who's, who lost their property. And so that's why they're labeled as Negro uprising. Um, some of them also were labeled um, saying, you know, something to the extent, this is how we ran people out of Tulsa, you know, running the Negro out of Tulsa, um, et cetera. So you're correct in noting that it is labeled as a Negro uprising and not a white terrorist attack or, or a white massacre of Negro citizens, of Black citizens. Thank you very much for your question. Um, I have a question um, also from Dave. How many white people died in the massacre? I believe approximately 12 white people died in the massacre. Okay. I believe approximately, this is the number that I have um, read. And when I was speaking with uh, Mr. Jefferson and Mr. Hill, this is the number that they spoke to. Thank you. Also from Joe, how does the current Tulsa, Oklahoma authorities regard the incident or Oklahoma authorities regard the incident? Today, um, publicly, the current Tulsa and Oklahoma authorities do regard the incident as a race massacre. They have spoken to that in most of the commemorative um, events that we have seen coming out of Tulsa, coming out of the University of Oklahoma, but also coming out of the mayor's office um, in Tulsa and also coming out um, of other elected officials um, in Tulsa. It has, it, there is a museum that is almost over Open that um, is quite demonstrative of what happened there. There's been a lot of discussion of it. There was also um, in the early 2000s, uh, um, um, 
a report that was done that made it very clear that corrected the history of it that really indicated that this was a race massacre. And so most of the people who are public officials um, in Tulsa and in Oklahoma will regard it um, either as a, as a massacre. All right. Um, from Catherine, was Dick Rowland lynched or any other black citizens lynched? Um, well, when we talk about lynching, we typically think of the person who is being hanged from a tree, but lynching actually is um, an illegal murder of a person um, by authorities um, outside. And we typically associate it with race, but lynchings also occur for people. Um, it's just an extra legal murder. All right, that's often associated with a mob, that's often associated with, you know, um, being burned alive or and hanged up high as a public notice to people that this what happens when you are not following the rules. So we think that about 300 black people were killed um, during the massacre and some people would include those um, murders as a lynching, all right? Uh, Dick Rowland, as far as I know, as I know, was killed uh, when this event took place. All right. Um, I have a very important question, and I think many people have this. How was the history so completely hidden for all these years? Well, um, in numerous ways. First of all, um, as one person, I believe it was Ms. Strauss, indicated, it was, it was not... It, it was hidden in plain sight that it, it, it was thought of or it was publicized by many people outside of black activist organizations like the NAACP, for example, as a, a quote unquote Negro riot. It was thought of as um, a group violence per, um, perpetuated by black people and the destruction of their, um, of their property. Um, it, and oftentimes when you see these events happen, as I said, the victims will be blamed. Secondarily, a lot of the people who were there were killed or ran away or were run away, you know, or moved away um, afterwards because they did not want to, that it was too traumatic for them to stay. <clears throat> Thirdly, there was also within the black community, the notion that we don't wanna talk about this, this is too painful. And also the fear that if they did talk about it, if they did document it, that they would continue to be um, victimized as a result of it. And so this is why it was completely hidden for all these years. Also, of course, um, textbooks that, um, that about the state history as well as the national history have excluded them. Uh, excluded these kinds of events. Tulsa is one of the most devastating of these kinds of events, but there were literally tens of these events, if not hundreds of them, from the 19th century through the 20th century. So there are many, many, many that we don't know about. Um, and so for all these reasons is one of the reasons why it was hidden. Of course, it's not hidden to the people who study these kinds of things, but um, hidden from the, the general public as is much of the history in the United States. Where did the capital for rebuilding Greenwood come from? Most of the capital for rebuilding Greenwood, as um, Carlos Hill uh, says, uh, comes from the people who put their coins together and rebuilt little by little. If you recall from some of the things that he talked about um, in this in the in the taping that we did, many of the people who own property were not allowed to claim um, to use their insurances. The insurance company refused um, to 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 give them the return on their policies. The property was destroyed, and they were not 
allowed to collect on them. Many of the people who uh, were business owners who survived left and started up again, but other people who remained began to rebuild. There were also collections that were taken uh, nationally. There were campaigns by some of the activist organizations to raise money um, for the people for these people as well. There were some wealthy people, black people in the United States who donated money for rebuilding, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, when these kinds of things happen, these traumatic events happen, people respond in different ways. Some people just want to leave and never return. And there's one of the survivors who talks about, you know, this is happening to her family, this happening to her family and, and moving to California and all of that. And then there are others who dig, um, dig our heels in and we stay and we fight and we rebuild little by little. Um, and so this is the, the banks, of course, were destroyed in the community. Some of the largest um, businesses were destroyed as well. But little by little, they were able to do so. Now, some people were not able to do so. Some, of, some people moved to Tulsa to help in the rebuilding as well, moved their businesses there because they wanted to be in defiance of this kind of white terror and its destruction of black property and, and black life. But um, some of the people who had small businesses in particular were not able to start over and went on to do um, other kinds of things instead. And I apologize for my dog barking uh, in the background. Again, zooming from home, these things happen. Um, have the Tulsa papers ever apologized for their role? I'm not certain if they have or not. That's an excellent question, but I just don't know um, the answer to it. Of course, the president of the United States was there today to, uh, to support these survivors and those people who are still, um, were still living in Tulsa and still trying to make Tulsa um, the black community that it, it, it wanted to be and was. And so, and he apologized for what happened there. So I think uh, that's a very important to note. Oftentimes we don't have, you know, the top executive from the nation, the president of the United States um, doing these kinds of things. So it's very important that um, this president um, showed up and did it. Um, so I have a question or a comment from Gina. I appreciate it so much about the panel, including the conversation about the proper name for this event, Massacre Riot, in your opinion, what do you think this event should be called? Um, well, uh, personally, I think that the event should be called a genocide. Uh, I think it's a genocidal event. Um, I think that massacre uh, is important. It, it certainly is an upgrade uh, and more, certainly more accurate than riot um, is because when we talk about riots, we often think about criminal elements of the victim, those people who are victimized and them being the, um, the criminals. And you can see that this has happened um, so much of this particular history. I think massacre is, uh, is uh, important to a certain extent because you have a large number of persons who are, who are killed willy-nilly uh, without um, uh, really having done anything to, um, um, to deserve being treated in, in such a horrific manner. But, but massacre doesn't really get to the fact that this is one of several. This is one of many, many, many events. And that is the reason why I would prefer to have a genocide because it happens in a collection of events that are meant specifically um, to quell Black um, life as well as Black business, as well as Black well-being. And so uh, when you are um, focused on a particular group of people and you want to destroy that group of people um, or hold them enslaved in one or the other, I think of um, as being a genocide. That is my own personal opinion. And of course, many people um, would say that that it's not something that they would say. Um, so how can we work to connect the dots between the reign of terror um, of the Assad, and I, again, I apologize if I have not pronounced um, correctly, tribal nation and the Tulsa race, race massacre to the history of white domestic terrorism in the US. 
Well, I think that this is from Lindsay and thank you, Lindsay. It's an excellent question. I think what we have to do is that we have to look at the, the ways in which people from different races have been treated um, in the country and whether or not we're talking about indigenous people, black people, Latinx people, Asian, Asian American, Pacific Islander people, whether we're talking about people who are um, disabled, people who are extremely poor, people who are uh, even in the 19th century, of course, there were all the Catholic um, riots that took place and destruction of Catholic churches, um, other destruction of, you know, synagogues, uh, much more recently of mosques, um, etc. I think that we have to look at the ways in which people who fall outside of a very specific and narrow um, main, what is called a mainstream are treated in the country, not only as these people are treated in law, but also are treated in practice. And I think in so doing, we can look at the reign of terror, we can look at, you know, the Tulsa race massacre, we can look at all these events that take place um, across broad categories of people and across time in our nation's history and understand that um, it has been problematic for people who don't fit a particular type of description, whether or not it's race or ethnicity, religion, language, um, sexuality, um, et cetera. Um, we, if you don't fit a certain kind of description, then you are marginalized and this marginalization, economic, political, social, um, et cetera, uh, will lead to, does lead to attack an attack in you know in in every way um, possible, a diminishment of your presence in the nation, a diminishment of our citizenship and our rights within the country too. So I think that we have to think more broadly just outside of what is happening specifically um, in this community or in that community and see that it happens in many communities and it could happen in any community if you find yourself on the margins of what is considered the mainstream um, at that time. Um, let's see. I wanna go to another question. Was there an exodus, this is from Renato, was there an exodus by the black community from Tulsa after the massacre? There was, um, you know, uh, many people left. We don't know how many people because we don't know how many people died. We don't know um, who's in those, uh, you know, those graves where many bodies have been found. We do not know how many people were dumped in the river because there was a lot of eyewitness accounts that said many bodies were dumped into the rivers. People were so terrorized that they spread, um, they spread out, they went to neighboring towns and what they found out once they got to neighboring towns is that they were followed there by some of the, uh, the terrorists um, who were spreading themselves out and did not want to um, be. So there was an exodus, people went to you know, other places in the West but they also came to California, they also went to um, Seattle, Washington, they went other places as well. So yes, indeed there was and they typically was when these events occurred, there typically was something of a of an exodus of the people. Whether we look at Rosewood, whether we look at Wilmington, you know, whether or not we look at Memphis in 1866, East St. Louis in 1917, Detroit, um, New York, etc., where these events occurred, there were people would leave and not come back. Uh, this is a very good uh, question, I think, um, from Troy. Um, I'm assuming that the set that's of that some of the victims may have lived through slavery. Yes, you're probably correct because, um, well, the last generation of people who were enslaved, some of them might have been in Tulsa at the time. Uh, many people did move to the West, but also black people had been enslaved, um, of course, in Tulsa. 
um, when the trail of, the trail of tears took um, uh, indigenous um, people to Oklahoma. They took with them the black people who were enslaved by some of these indigenous peoples. And so they would have then um, stayed in that area. Some of them stayed in that area and some of them would have migrated to Tulsa as well. Were all of the temporary deputies de-deputized after the massacre, massacre from Samantha? I think probably so. Um, I think probably so, particularly after, you know, the National Guard settled down and began to do the job of stopping the violence of, you know, most of the violence was over um, once they actually organized themselves or they participated in some of it themselves. But um, once the National Guard arrived, there was really no need to continue to have all of these people deputies because, you know, up to hundreds of them were deputized. Um, and so uh, once that was over, it was done. Um, it was done with. How do we keep from Jane, a uh, Jean, I'm sorry. How do we keep this story alive beyond the commemorative period? Well, I think one of the ways of keeping the story alive is to learn the new stories, to continue to learn the stories because there are many of them. And, and it's not just within the African-American community, but within other communities as well, as it's the Latinx um, community, the indigenous communities, um, the Asian, a, Asian, Asian American, Pacific Island communities. There are many, many stories um, like this. Many people don't realize, for example, that um, you know when the gold rush came, um, hundreds of thousands of indigenous people were massacred in California to make way for those persons who were in the gold rush. Uh, many people don't realize that the first mass hanging that took place in Los Angeles was in 1871 and was Chinese men. You know, so there are many, many stories um, like this across all communities. There's a big race riot. I mean, um, anti-Catholic um, riot that takes place or massacre that takes place in um, in Philadelphia in the 19th century, in New Orleans, in Boston. So, you know, um, there are so many stories like this in, in, in our nation. And so I think in order to keep this one alive, we have to continue to learn um, the new the new ones, uh, the ones that we don't know of. Um, and we need to talk about them and we need to connect the dots between what happened in the past and what is happening um, in our society today. And not only in the United States, but globally as well as we see, you know, people who fall outside of what is considered, you know, appropriate by those people who control a society as those persons are um, abused. Let me see if I can get, um, okay. Somebody asked again the question about Dick Rowland. As far as I know, Dick Rowland did not survive the massacre. Um, and so that is as far as, as I know, as just having read the books and um, that material. So, um, so I, I wanted to just say that. How much of a threat is the legislation against racial discussions in schools? Oh, it's a big threat. This is a this is a um, this is a question from Brianna. How much a threat is the legislation against racial discussions in schools? And so you might or might not be aware that there's been a groundswell movement to end discussions about race, what people think of as critical race theory, um, in schools. And um, to be clear about this, I think um, it, it is a threat. I mean, people don't want people, I'm on a board for a private um, high school and um, you know, there's been a whole year of people in these high schools and, and in public schools as well as a result of the Black Lives Matter um, and other kinds of protests that took place with the several killings that took place by the police in the last few years or so of African-Americans. And um, people 
don't want these stories told. I really can't understand why, um, because it is American history and there are really great things in American history and there are really bad things in American history. And, you know, America is not different um, in that way from any other nation that's ever existed. I know many people in this country think that America is exceptional and we are exceptional in some ways, but not in that way. Um, and we cannot become exceptional in that way until we know the histories, we know the stories. And, you know, the people in, in the different communities know the stories. So we just, we haven't shared the stories across those communities, but in so doing you build strength and you build coalitions, you make the nation better, you move towards a more equality, you move towards, you know, more better democracy, a stronger democracy. So I, I don't really don't understand why people don't want to discuss race. It's such a big issue within our society. How are you gonna prepare your children to live in the future if they don't, you know, to work and to, you know, to do well in their private lives, in their professional lives, if they don't understand the society in which they live. But I do think it is a great threat. I think, you know, many people have passed legislation with regard to it. And therefore, um, you know, the, the children who are going to be in those schools are going to, first of all, not be prepared for the future. And then secondly, they are going to, um, to to not be able to to live peacefully and happily in a society that they don't understand. Um, and of course, for the people whose histories of being excluded um, in these schools, we will continue to, of course, face stereotype, um, to face abuse, exclusion, et cetera, because the history does not reflect the the, the reality of, of our lives, the, the many, many things that, immigrants have given to our society that, you know, every racial group, um, every, every, every group of people have given to our society. Um, every, there is not a group in our society that has not contributed to the wealth and greatness of this nation. And so um, learning that I think is, is really very important if we want to have the kind of country that is proposed um, in our founding documents. Okay, so I have um, I have a couple of more questions. This is from Steve. Um, had the events that precipitated the massacre not occurred in 1921, do historians feel the conditions or atmosphere in Tulsa were such that it may have occurred eventually um, through different circumstances? Well, I think um, I, I'm not certain because there were a lot of events that occurred like this in the in the nation. Um, again, so I, I'll bring up um, Wilmington. I'll bring up Rosewood. I'll I'll, I'll talk about um, some of the things what happened in Memphis. Um, and so there are many many of these events. Some of them are related to political um, elections and things like that. Some of them are, are related to people feeling as if African-Americans were quote unquote getting out of our place socially or economically or politically. Um, many sites of black wealth were targeted in the late 19th and early 20th through the mid 20th century um, really. And so because Tulsa was such a site of black wealth, uh, and a black accomplishment, it sort of had a bullseye on it. Now, this one event triggered it. There, of course, had been other lynchings that had taken place in Oklahoma and in Tulsa um, prior to that time. There had been a lot of lynchings of African American males who were coming back from World War um, One, who were armed. There had been um, destruction of other, you know. Um, small shops or businesses that people felt were in competition um, with white businesses at the time. And so it's hard to say that it, it would not occur, but given the wealth and the prominence of Tulsa as a site of black excellence, since those were often the sites um, that were targeted by um, these by white terrorists. Um, now from Jerry, can you comment on disruptive freeway construction through communities with the intent to socially divide? 
Well, thank you for that question, Jerry. There, of course, um, this is something that also happened in Tulsa um, after the Greenwood Massacre. Um, of, many years later, there was that that neighborhood was divided by a freeway that was placed through it. Um, they just, I believe, reconstructed a, um, a bridge to connect the two communities. They're doing that in other places as well. I believe that um, Transportation Secretary Buttigieg is thinking about trying to undo some of the damage that was done, particularly in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s that divided communities. It certainly happened in Los Angeles. It happened in my in my hometown of, uh, of Portsmouth, Virginia, when I was a very small child and our neighborhood was divided because they put in um, um, 64 interstate um, interstate 64 in, in Virginia and we ended up losing our home and having to move to another neighborhood um, as and you know and losing all of our friends and our school and all that that was there so it's happened lots of places um, and so this is uh, this is something that's at least 50 years old now and I guess it it can continuing to to happen what happens some of the consequences I, I think that you are indicating, Jerry, is that when it divides the communities, of course, the if you are an entrepreneur, then um, your customer base is divided, um, and you don't you cannot no longer thrive um, at this because you don't have the same customers or the same number of customers. It does divide the community culturally, so that um, you know places where people would gather, where they ha would have clubs, where they were have community meetings, et cetera, um, disappeared. Um, the stories that passed from generation from generation in communities about the community, how the community, what the community suffered, what the community accomplished, that kind of very key socialization um, for our children um, evaporates. Um, the kinds of connections that you have with educational institutions in the area disappears um, as well. And so there is a lot of negative um, there are lots of negative consequences for divisions um, of communities. And the, it, of course, one of the, the biggest consequences is breaking up of legislative districts as well of voting districts and dispersing you know, the power that after you've built up your, the people who are particular um, political ideologies in one area than to have that divided. And so, you know, um, your impact on what happens in your district where you live is therefore weakened, um, et cetera. So um, I think that there, we're gonna hear a lot more about this because of Buttigieg's um, decisions in this regard, but also because there are many, many activists of these, these older divided communities that are asking and demanding that some, that some thing be done to um, to pull the communities back together again, or at least to give reparations for those businesses um, that were destroyed, for the housing that was lost. I remember uh, when we lost our house, the, the amount of money that my father received for the house was much less than the house was valued. Of course, black real estate is not valued very highly or not in relationship to, to white real estate at any rate, but it was difficult then to buy in a diff another community because the value of, of our home had um, had been so reduced. Everyone had to leave. You didn't have a you didn't have a choice. You couldn't stay, you know. And so um, you took whatever you had and you stored it over again. Of course, this is what happened in Tulsa um, as well. Um, many of the people did just slowly but surely um, help each other out, come together collectively um, and try to rebuild those persons who were not so terrorized that they had to, to leave. Well, I wanna thank all of you all for joining um, us this evening. I want to remind you that we will be um, on Thursday night, uh, there will be a discussion that I am having um, with uh, these wonderful people who have put together the Watchmen. Um, and I think you'll find it very interesting. It was a show that is set in, it is a show that is set in Tulsa um, and begins with the Tulsa massacre. And so um, this is a, a really, 
interesting way and we've done well, important way of teaching our nation and the world of the various histories that we have not been aware of, that we've not been given an opportunity to learn. And so it'll be interesting talking to um, Damon um, uh, and to Cord, the creator and one of the writers uh, of the show and, um, and I look forward to you all being here and your very interesting questions again. There will be two other events that The Hammer is sponsoring along with African American Studies at UCLA um, that linked to the commemoration of the Tulsa massacre. And so please do sign up for them. And thank you all again very, very much. I appreciate your questions and I appreciate your commitment to learning more and more about our history as a nation.